welcome to uh, the next tutorial series and today we shall be looking at uh, neural networks and computational graph uh, don't forget in the last lecture we actually considered the multivariate linear regression and we also considered the logistic regression the only difference between the linear regression and logistic regression is that in our logistic regression, we squash our W transpose of X into a sigmoid function. And we make a threshold of 0 0.5 to be able to determine the, the two classes of class 0 and class 1. Now today we shall be looking at neural networks and computational graphs. Remember for logistic regression for binary classification, uh, some of the review question is what is the form of the hypothesis of HWX uh, for logistic regression? You may want to pause to be able to answer these questions yourself. You will remember that um, if you are paused and you are back, remember that the form of the hypothesis for logistic regression is very close to linear regression. And as I just mentioned, the only difference is whatever it is that we have actually calculated, that is our W transpose of X, we squash this into a sigmoid, and that is the form of our hypothesis. This gives us our HW of X. So we squash the result into our, we squash the result. So this is essentially what makes the difference. How do we interpret HW of X? How do we make a prediction for a new X? Remember, we have squashed this into uh, a sigma function, and we say anything that is below uh, and is 0 0.5 and below, we categorize it as belonging to class 0, and anything above as class 1. What is the cost function for logistic regression? Remember, we showed us a graph where we do a negative log and we do 1 minus log. Uh, what type of boundaries is the logistic regression algorithm learning? Even though we might be tempted to look at it that this is learning uh, uh, what you call a, a non-linear, but essentially what the, the type of boundary it is learning is a linear separable. Because by the time we pick up the threshold, we can linearly group all those that are below uh, 0 0.5 as one class and those that are above as another class. All right. So, just like I mentioned, this is the answer to our questions. So, it shows that we introduce a sigmoid. Uh, this is a hypothesis output. We make a prediction based on uh, what you have inside is our cost function where we say we have uh, 1 minus this we have log of this okay and to fit our parameters we are minimizing w we make our predictions we are actually calculating <coughs> excuse me um, based on uh, the update value which is 0 0.5 and we said that the decision boundary is actually linear okay so the decision boundary is linear and it, uh, logistic regression is a linear classifier that we're actually using it to draw a line of separation between our, our training samples all right so well, in the real world, we are often faced with non-linearly separable data. That is, data that we cannot just draw a straight line and be sure that we are able to differentiate, uh, demarcate the line of boundary. We are often uh, seen non-linearly separable. For instance, if you look at this, this place, you will see that the data that are in red and the data that are in green, there's no way we can draw a straight line to, to correctly separate the lines. It's not possible. 
for instance, an attempt here to be able to draw this line and categorize everything here as green, we, we have missed all this. All these ones have been, all this green has been missed. And that's a lot. So here too, if you separate this and we draw this line this way, you will see here that we have missed this green. We have missed all these greens, these ones. So this is not giving us the best line of fit into this data point. How do we now achieve that? Neural network can learn a much more complex functions, uh, which you can also refer to as equation uh, and nonlinear decision boundaries. So we can use neural networks to actually help us learn the function that will help us to be able to separate our data point more correctly. For instance, this is a function that actually separates the red data from the green. You can see this is a very complex function. It's difficult to actually uh, write an equation, a function, if, uh, an equation that will give us this, this kind of curve that separates the red from the green. This is another uh, curve. Is another function that gives us the separation from this. So these are more complex functions. How does the neural computation work? The intuition behind the neural com computations is taken from the human brains. In the human brains, we have what we call the axion, we have what we call the cell body, the dendrite, and uh, presynaptic uh, termina. And essentially what happens is that we have the axon, which represents our weight here, we, that connect the cell body to the uh, termina. So impulses carried away from cell body. Now, so in an artificial neuron, trying to look at uh, how this compares to our human brain is when you actually pass um, information flow maybe from our eyes or from our nose or from uh, a sense of touch or from uh, uh, eat or feeling it actually goes through uh, a neuron in our brain certain part of certain neurons in our brain get activated uh, based on what we see for instance if you see a bright light or you see a dark light a certain part of our brain get activated so this represents the cell's body where the computation is taking place. And each of these x1, x2, x3 represent the input. And we're trying to learn the weight matrix W1, W2, W3, which performs a function here plus the bias and goes through an activation function to be able to give us an output. In the neural network uh, architectures, we actually have some terminologies that we need to know. Our input function, our input uh, neurons forms what we call the input layer, and our output neurons forms what we call the output layer. Don't forget that each of these is a neuron. This is a neuron, this is a neuron, this is a neuron, this is a neuron. So which we can also refer to as computational node. In between our input layer and output layer are what we call bunch of neurons that gives us the hidden layer. So this is one layer, uh, one hidden layer inside this. So the terminology used is, we say this is a one hidden layer neural network, or we normally count the hidden layer and the output layer, then we can say this is a two layer neural network. This is a three layer neural network. Now, you can see here that in this case, we say this uh, actually, each of the neurons has a connection to this uh, uh, to, to the layer above it. So you will see that this neuron connect to all the neurons here. As you see, this connect to all, and this neuron connects to all. There are a number of activation functions that have been proposed and that are in use. You will discover that our activation function, the notion comes from here. This is our F, and our F represents the activation function. In our linear regression, 
we are not using any activation function all right so we're not concerned but in this case we are actually uh, have options of different activation functions that can be used we have the sigmoid which you have seen you have the chan h you have the relu which is mostly used and we have the leaky relu we have the max out and we have the hello uh, i think this is elastic linear unit and some more so we can uh, see our neuron as a binary logistic regression what does it do it takes in our input with the bias these are bias and it learns the weight matrix to multiply with the input add the bias then squashes it into our activation function which in this case is the sigma and gives us a prediction and so when we now run several logistic regression at the same time and we have a neural network so if we feed in a vector of input into a bunch of logistic function then we get a vector of output now we can also now feed in another logistic regression uh, unit to be able to get our output so essentially what this is now doing is this once you have already have an input uh, layers send uh, each of them connected to our eating layer and uh, we had a bias as well into this. So this is telling us that this is the activation that we get for this um, activation. This one represents the first one, first neuron, activation for the second neuron, activation for the third neuron. Then we say in this two, which is we refer to as uh, second layer. Essentially, it should just be the first layer because we don't normally count this input as a layer. So, uh, we don't have to decide ahead of time what variables this logistic regression are trying to predict. It's a loss function that will direct the intermediate hidden variables to be able to do that job of prediction. So let's see the matrix notation for our layer. Now this A represents the activations. I uh, find it easy to see the activation as just like a representation of your input. Okay, so what essentially what your activation is doing is your activations, we now, this activation A1, A2 and so on will now serve as your new inputs since you already uh, we have already computed this x1 x2 our original input with our uh, weight matrix to be able to get a different values here so that this now becomes what you can refer to as our new input but we'll call them activation or activation maps or feature representation so the first uh, then we do is that we get our initial input multiplied by the weight matrices plus the bias and we get our activation after we have passed to the z all of this into a function which could be sigma which could be max out which could be relu and by the way relu stands for rectified linear unit so the activation f is applied element wise that is what we're trying to say is that after you have computed for this one x1 you get a z1 you apply the activation for that activation for z2 <coughs> excuse me activation for z3 and by the way the notation is when you have w12 you are saying the weight matrix that connects the first neuron in the in this layer that is the higher layer to the second neuron in the preceding layer so this is one to two 
So this one will be W, this line will be W22, this line will be W21. And don't forget the bias. So how do we learn non-linearities? The activation function helps us to be able to learn the non-linear curves. Without non-linearity, deep neural network can't do anything more than just a linear transformation. We need to be able to learn the curves that will go through our data point sufficiently well. So, and what you now do is, if you just have one layer, maybe we can learn a curve that is like this. As we increase the number of our layers, we begin to learn a better curve that goes through our data set in a more efficient way. As we increase the number of our layers, you see that we now have a better curve that even fits exactly to all our data points. There's a sample network. We have all our inputs and we have our layer, hidden layer, and we have our output. And our prediction is calculated this way. Now, sometimes we omit the bias arrows. So, I omit this bias. How do we train our neural network? And how do we choose our parameters W and B? Essentially, we are used to our training data, which consists of X and Y pairs. And our W and B are our natural parameters. And when we say natural parameters, we can't overemphasize. They are just a bunch of numbers that we're trying to adjust to the best possible. So we defined a linear uh, and logistic regression function, the cost function, which is the difference between our prediction and the actual. How do we choose our natural parameters? We try to minimize that loss and we use gradient descent to do that. So how can we do gradient descent? We can decide to do gradient descent by using paper, but the better ways to do is we try to use a computational graph. And that's where we're going to stop and we'll continue to see how we can do greater descent using the computational graph. Thank you for listening and do stay tuned for the next series.